1. The Final Words of Buddha Buddha traveled through all the regions of northern India and Nepal, spending his life teaching his followers. At the age of 80, he entered nirvana, leaving his earthly body behind. Before his passing, Buddha said, My followers, this is my final advice to you. Everything in this world is subject to change. Nothing is permanent. You must strive to save your own souls. Someone once said, The only certainty in this world is that everything will change. Nothing lasts forever. Perhaps this statement originates from Buddha's last words. This advice is the culmination of his years of wandering, witnessing the full spectrum of human emotions, understanding the depths of suffering and loss, and listening to countless life stories. Knowing that everything will eventually change, if you lose all your possessions, consider it a part of life and don't waste your energy, intellect, or health on regrets. Understanding that nothing is permanent. If the person you love chooses not to love you anymore, smile and accept it as a universal law and move on. Do not torment yourself or persist in making each other miserable. Realizing that nothing lasts forever, if a loved one passes away, do not be overwhelmed by sorrow. It is the cycle of life. Birth, aging, illness, and death are inevitable for everyone. Live well so that the departed can rest in peace and do meaningful things until you meet them again in the next world. 2. The Wild Deer Long ago there was a beautiful forest. Many deer lived there. One day the king came with his servants to hunt in the forest. The king shot an arrow and hit a mother deer. The mother deer ran away in pain. Later, the king found the mother deer hiding in the bushes with her baby deer beside her. Even though the mother deer was bleeding and crying, she was still feeding her baby deer. Soon after, the mother deer died. The king felt regretful. He picked up the baby deer and said to it, I will take care of you. Then the king broke his bow in half and said, I will never harm anyone again. To remember that day, the king named the forest the park of the wild deer. Lesson. Like humans, animals also feel fear. We should not harm them. It's wrong and selfish. 3. The moon is watching us. One day there was a very poor family. They often went to their neighbor's garden to steal fruits and vegetables. One night the father took his young son to sneak into the neighbor's garden to steal some carrots. While the father was pulling up a few carrots, his son stood beside him. Suddenly, the son whispered, Dad, someone is watching us. The father became frightened. He looked around but saw no one. Where? Who is watching us? He asked his son. The son pointed to the sky. There, Dad, the moon saw us. The father was shocked to hear his son say this. He had thought that no one could see what they were doing that night. His son's words made him feel ashamed. He threw the carrots down and took his son's hand. The two of them went back home in the moonlight. After that night, he never stole anything again. Moral of the story, if we steal, people will find out. 4. Buddha and Rahula Rahula was Buddha's only son, who had become a monk. He was the youngest among the monks. Everyone loved and spoiled Rahula too much. Rahula did whatever he wanted. Sometimes, Rahula would lie just to tease someone. One day, Buddha told Rahula, Bring me a bowl of water. I want to wash my feet. After washing his feet in the bowl, he asked Rahula, Would you like to drink all of this water? No, the water is dirty now, Rahula replied. Buddha asked Rahula to pour out the water. Buddha said to Rahula, When water becomes dirty, nobody wants to use it. It's like the stories people make up. Nobody cares about them anymore. Tears of shame ran down Rahula's cheeks. From then on, Rahula never told a lie again. Lesson. We should always tell the truth. 5. 
The Fawn's Narrow Escape A wise deer taught all the fawns how to escape from hunters. One fawn in the group was very obedient and smart. This fawn never misbehaved in class and always thanked its teacher after every lesson. One day, this fawn got caught in a hunter's trap. The other deer panicked and scattered. They ran to tell the fawn's mother the bad news. The mother deer cried when she heard about her fawn in the trap. The teacher reassured the mother deer, Please don't worry. Your fawn is a great student and will know how to return safely. When the fawn was trapped, it remembered what the teacher had said. The fawn pretended to be dead by holding its breath and staying still. The hunter, thinking the fawn was actually dead, got ready to skin it. Just then, the fawn jumped up and ran away as fast as the wind. The fawn's friends were overjoyed to see it again. They thanked their wise teacher for teaching them such useful lessons. Moral of the story. Study hard to earn your rewards. 6. Buddha Threads a Needle Anuruddha was a very skilled practitioner but was blind. Anuruddha didn't feel bad about himself because even though he was blind, he still took care of his daily activities by himself. One day, Anuruddha noticed his robe was torn. He tried to mend it, but it was very difficult. Anuruddha couldn't even thread the needle. Buddha came into the room and threaded the needle for Anuruddha. Anuruddha asked, Who threaded the needle for me? Buddha helped you thread it, Buddha replied as Anuruddha continued mending his robe. Anuruddha felt so grateful and moved that he shed tears. Lesson. Always help with what others need. 7. United We Stand, The Story of Survival and Teamwork A man with a limp and a blind man were abandoned in a house. Unfortunately, the house caught fire. Both were terrified. The blind man couldn't see the way out, and the man with the limp couldn't walk out of the house on his own. They decided to help each other. The blind man carried the man with the limp on his back. The man with the limp guided the blind man on where to go. Together, they escaped the burning house. The morale of the story. If we help each other, we can overcome obstacles together. 8. The Fish Market Lesson Buddha and his disciple Ananda were collecting alms in a city when they walked past a fish market. Buddha said, Ananda, touch the string used to tie the fish and then smell your hand. Ananda did so and exclaimed, It smells terrible! Buddha explained, This is like choosing friends. If you befriend bad people, you will become bad yourself. It's similar to the foul smell of the string in the fish market. Next, they passed a spice shop. Buddha suggested, Ananda, touch the spice packets and then smell your hand. Ananda did so and said, My hand smells wonderful. Buddha said, This is like making friends. If you befriend good people, you will become good. It's like the pleasant scent on your hand from touching the spice packets. The lesson here is, if we make good and sincere friends, we will become better people. If we associate with lazy and mean individuals, we will adopt their negative traits. 9. The Fox and the Two Otters A fox's wife wanted to eat some fresh fish. The fox tried to find fresh fish for his wife in a nearby river. He saw two otters fighting over a large fish on the riverbank. Both wanted the best part of the fish for themselves. The fox watched the otters fighting for a while. Then he approached and asked if he could help them divide the fish. The two otters happily agreed. The fox divided the fish into three parts. He gave the head to one otter and the tail to the other. While the otters were wondering how the fox would share the best part of the fish, the fox ran away with the best part in his hands. Both otters could only blame themselves for being too selfish. Moral. Don't be selfish. Share with others. 10. The snake's head and tail. The tail of the snake fought with the head. The tail said, You have been leading for too long. Now it's my turn to lead. The head replied, I'm the commander. 
I have eyes and a mouth. The tail argued back. You need me to move. Without me, you can't go anywhere. Unfortunately, the tail got stuck in a branch and couldn't get out. The head refused to help, allowing the tail to lead. The head didn't want to assist the tail. The tail couldn't see the path ahead. Then the snake fell into a fire. The snake was burned to death. Morale. Fighting among ourselves can harm us all. 11. The Street Cleaner There was a woman who worked very hard cleaning the streets. Because of her job, her clothes were always dirty and smelly, and everyone avoided her if they saw her. People were quite surprised when they saw Buddha talking happily with her. They asked Buddha, You always tell us to keep clean. Why are you talking to such a smelly woman? Buddha replied, Even though that woman might smell, her soul is very pure. She is polite and works hard to clean the streets for everyone. Some people may look very clean and well-dressed, but their souls are full of bad thoughts. The lesson, having a pure soul is far more important than wearing clean, nice clothes. 12. Purifying the mind like a goldsmith refines gold. Monks, just as there are impurities mixed in with gold like dust, sand, and gravel, a goldsmith pours the gold into a sluice and washes it, repeatedly pouring water over it, washing it over and over. After this process, the gold still contains smaller impurities like fine sand and gravel, so the goldsmith washes it repeatedly once more. Now the gold still has some fine sand and black dust attached, and then the goldsmith washes it one last time to completely remove all impurities, leaving only the pure gold. Then the goldsmith places the gold bar into the furnace, blows air through a tube, blowing repeatedly until the gold starts to melt, but it doesn't pour out of the furnace. Next, the goldsmith continues to blow air, but if the gold hasn't reached purity, he keeps blowing until the piece of gold becomes soft, shiny, unbroken, and malleable. Now, if he wishes to make gold bracelets, earrings, necklaces, or rings, the jeweler can use this gold bar to craft the desired jewelry. Similarly, monks, when practicing to elevate the mind, if coarse impurities such as bad physical actions, verbal actions, and mental actions still exist, monks must make an effort to think, find ways to remove, cleanse, and utterly prevent them from arising again. After doing so, Monks continue to practice elevating the mind. If medium impurities such as lustful, angry, and harmful thoughts still exist, they must make even more effort to remove, completely end, and prevent them from arising again. After completing this, monks again continue to elevate the mind. And if they find subtle impurities such as thoughts about family, country, and honor still exist, they must continue to make an effort to eliminate and prevent them from arising. When the mind becomes soft and usable, if one wishes to achieve supernatural powers, such as clairvoyance and clairaudience, etc., monks have the ability to accomplish these supernatural powers. 13. Buddha sends a disciple to fetch water from a stream. Once upon a time, on their journey to spread enlightenment, Buddha traveled across India with 1250 monks. These monks, barefoot and with shaved heads, faced hardships with quiet determination, their presence exuding calmness and resolve. When they reached a small stream, they encountered a large group of traders. Before the monks could drink, the trader's elephant muddied the waters, leaving the stream filthy. As dusk fell, Buddha decided to camp in the dense forest nearby, despite the lack of clean water for drinking or washing. Ananda, one of his disciples, protested, concerned about the absence of clean water. Buddha reminded him of the stream they had passed, but Ananda argued that the elephant had made the water too muddy to use. Buddha handed Ananda a clay bowl, silently instructing him to fetch water from the stream. Despite Ananda's reluctance, Buddha urged him to go quickly. 
Halfway there, Ananda returned, suggesting they fetch water from a distant river instead, fearing the stream's water might be harmful. Buddha responded that distant water couldn't quench immediate thirst. Ananda continued to protest, but Buddha simply asked if he had reached the stream yet. Ananda admitted he hadn't, leading Buddha to question how he could know the water's condition. Despite having seen the muddy water earlier, Buddha calmly stated that the situation might have changed. Confused, Ananda went to the stream, expecting to find muddy water, but to his surprise the water was clear. He wondered if Buddha had used divine sight to know this. After fetching the water, Ananda shared his thoughts with Buddha, who explained that just as water flows and clears itself, so can the human heart be purified, regardless of past misdeeds. Buddha likened this to the stream's ability to cleanse itself, illustrating that everything in the world is in constant flux, including the teachings of Buddhism. He emphasized the importance of observing and understanding these changes to grasp the universe's truths and maintain a pure heart. 14. Training, like taming a horse. Badali, a disciple, struggled with self-control and was often led by desires. To teach Badali how to master his inner self, the Buddha explained the process of taming a horse. Imagine Badali. A skilled horse trainer receives a fine, gentle horse. The first step is to get the horse used to the bridle. During training, if the horse bucks, leaps, or resists because it's untrained, the trainer patiently continues the training until the horse becomes comfortable with the bridle. Then, the trainer gets the horse accustomed to the saddle. The horse may struggle or resist, but with persistent training, it gradually gets used to the saddle. Next, the trainer teaches the horse to parade, trot, gallop, sprint, and neigh loudly. Once the horse masters these skills, the trainer acclimates it to decorations like bells, floral garlands, and jewels. Badali, when the horse is fully trained in all these tasks, it becomes a noble steed, a treasure for a king. Similarly, Badali, when a monk develops and perfects virtues, he becomes respected, revered, and worthy of offerings, becoming a supreme field of merit in the world. Badali, a monk who attains right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right knowledge, and right liberation, becomes highly esteemed, revered and worthy of offerings, serving as a supreme field of merit in the world. 15. Practicing Meditation, like tuning a string instrument. Once upon a time, the Buddha was staying at Mount Vulture Peak near the city of Rajagaha, while his disciple Sona was in the Sita Forest, not far from Rajagaha. Sona was struggling with maintaining mindfulness and was overwhelmed by negative emotions. Thinking about returning to secular life to perform good deeds and enjoy happiness like an ordinary person. Aware of his disciples' thoughts through his supernatural awareness, the Buddha went to Sona and inquired about his recent thoughts. Sona admitted to having such thoughts. The Buddha then used Sona's expertise in playing the veena, a stringed instrument, to encourage him to continue his diligent practice. Sona, what do you think? When the strings of the veena are too tight, do they produce the right tone? No, they do not, Lord Buddha. And when the strings are too loose, is the sound pleasant? No, Lord Buddha. So, when the strings are neither too tight nor too loose, but tuned to a moderate level, does the sound become pleasant? Yes, it does, Lord Buddha. Likewise, Sona, when the mind is too tense, it becomes restless. When it is too lax, it leads to laziness. Therefore, you need to apply a balanced state of mind, not too tense and not too lax, to make progress in your practice. Yes, Lord Buddha. Following the Buddha's guidance, Sona lived alone, in peace, without indulgence, and practiced with a balanced effort. 
As a result, he achieved the ultimate goal that all noble seekers aspire to, the supreme enlightenment, and lived peacefully in the present moment. Hey, everyone. Your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom. 16. Guard your senses. Like a turtle, fears a wolf. The Buddha said to the monks, one evening, a turtle and a wolf were both out hunting. The turtle, seeing the wolf from afar, quickly pulled its legs and head into its shell and stayed perfectly still and silent. The wolf, spotting the turtle from a distance, approached thinking, as soon as the turtle exposes any part of itself, I'll grab it, snap it off, and have a feast. However, the turtle didn't expose any part of itself, so the wolf, finding no opportunity, grew bored and left. Similarly, monks, evil forces, are always lurking, thinking, I might catch these monks off guard through their eyes, their tongues, their minds. Therefore, you must always stay alert and guard your senses. When your eyes see beauty, don't be captivated by the whole or the details. If you find any cause due to unguarded eyes for greed, sorrow, or other negative states to arise, overcome that cause and strive to guard your sense of sight. When your ears hear sounds, your nose smells scents, your tongue tastes flavors, your body feels touches, your mind perceives thoughts. Don't be captivated by the whole or the details. If you find any cause due to an uncontrolled mind for greed, sorrow, or other negative states to arise, overcome that cause and strive to guard your mind. Monks, as long as you live guarding your senses, evil forces will find no opportunity and growing bored with you will leave, just as the wolf did with the turtle. 17. Getting Fire from Dry Wood One day, the Buddha met Agivasana, a disciple of the Nikaya school, and taught him how to get fire from wood. Agivasana, imagine there's a log full of sap soaked in water. Someone comes with a fire-starting tool thinking, I'm going to produce fire and make heat appear. Can this person generate heat by rubbing the tool against the log? No, Lord Gautama. Because the log is wet, no matter how much they try, they won't be able to produce fire. Similarly, Agivasana, any monk or Brahmin living without renunciation, without cutting off bodily and mental desires such as lust, greed, and craving, can't naturally achieve supreme enlightenment. And if they suddenly experience intense, painful sensations, they won't achieve supreme enlightenment either. Now, Agivasana, Imagine a log that's soaked and full of sap, pulled out of the water and placed on dry ground. Then someone tries to rub it with a tool to produce fire. Can they? No, Lord Gotama. Because the log is soaked, that person will only end up tired and frustrated. Likewise, Agivasana, any monk or Brahmin who doesn't renounce bodily and mental desires can't achieve supreme enlightenment. Now, Agivasana, imagine a dry log, without sap, pulled out of the water and placed on dry ground. Someone comes with a fire-starting tool, thinking, I will produce fire, and flames will appear. What do you think? Can this person make fire appear? Yes, Lord Gautama. Because the log is dry, without sap, and has been taken out of the water and placed on dry ground. In the same way, Agivasana, any monk or Brahmin who lives with renunciation, having cut off desires for the body and mind, can naturally achieve supreme enlightenment, or upon suddenly experiencing intense pains, can achieve supreme enlightenment. 18. Living like a driftwood Once, the Buddha was staying in Kasambi by the Ganges River when he saw a piece of driftwood flowing down the stream, he said to his disciples, Monks, if that piece of wood does not get stuck on this bank or the other bank, 
does not sink in the middle, does not get stranded on a sandbar, is not picked up by humans, is not taken by non-humans, does not get caught in a whirlpool and does not rot from within, then it will reach the sea, flow to the sea, and merge into the sea. Why? Because the flow of the Ganges is towards the sea, leads to the sea, merges into the sea. Similarly, monks, if you do not get stuck on this bank, you will reach nirvana, flow to nirvana, and merge into nirvana. Lord Buddha, please explain the meaning of these examples. Monks, this bank refers to the six internal senses, and the other bank refers to the six external senses. Sinking in the middle means being overwhelmed by desire. Getting stranded on a sandbar means being caught in ego. Getting caught in a whirlpool means being entangled in the five sensual pleasures. Being picked up by humans means having close relationships with lay people, sharing their joys and sorrows, being happy when they are happy, suffering when they suffer, and getting involved in their affairs. Being taken by non-humans means living a religious life with the hope, with these precepts, ascetic practices, I will become a god or a brahmin. Rotting from within means accepting wrong precepts, following evil teachings, living impurely, engaging in suspicious and shady activities, appearing as a monk without truly being one, showing the exterior of ascetic practices without the inner purity, being corrupted inside, filled with desires like a pile of dirty rubbish. 19. The poor man who carried manure and met Buddha in an alley. When Buddha was alive, India was still deeply divided into many social classes. Among them, the Sudra class, considered the lowest, was treated as dirty and placed on the same level as animals. They lived at the very bottom of society, without respect or dignity. In the city of Shravasti, there was a Sudra named Ni De. He was kind-hearted and honest, spending his days cleaning latrines and doing the dirty work that no one else wanted to do. One day, Buddha, accompanied by his disciple Ananda, was walking through Shravasti when they came across a narrow alley and met Ni De. At that moment, Ni De was carrying a full load of manure. Seeing Buddha, he became frightened and tried to find a way to avoid meeting him. But the alley was too narrow, so he could only bow his head and say, Honored Buddha, I am filthy. Please don't come any closer, lest you lose your purity. Buddha approached Ni De and asked, Ni De, would you like to leave your lay life and become a monk? Back then, monks and Brahmins, the priestly class, were considered the most noble in society, a sacred realm that ordinary sudras like Ni De would never dare to enter. Therefore, Ni De hesitantly replied, You are the noble Buddha, and I am but a lowly person. How could I possibly compare to your disciples? Buddha said, The Dharma, like clean water, can cleanse all that is unclean. Whatever it is in the world, once bathed in the Dharma, becomes pure. The Dharma, like sacred fire, can burn all impurities to ash. Whatever it touches instantly becomes pure. The Buddha's teachings treat all beings equally, without distinction between rich and poor. Anyone who believes in the Buddha can practice the teachings and escape the cycle of suffering. Moved by Buddha's words, Ni De devoted himself to practice and soon became an enlightened disciple, achieving the state of an arhat. However, Ni De's transformation and acceptance by Buddha caused jealousy among the prideful in society. How could a lowly sudra become a monk and receive offerings from people? As a result, wherever Ni De went, people avoided him. Wherever he sat, they cleaned as if it was a dirty place. Eventually, when their resentment and anger peaked, they complained to the king, claiming that Buddha should not treat Nide as a disciple. When the king heard this, he personally went to inquire from Buddha. As he approached the gate in his chariot, he had to dismount and walk. Suddenly, he saw a monk sitting in meditation on a large rock. 
Politely, the king asked, I wish to see Buddha. Can you go inside and inform him of this? The monk walked through the rock, appearing to move through it as if it were air. Meeting Buddha, the king expressed his respect. Honored Buddha, the monk I saw earlier possessed extraordinary energy. Can you tell me his noble name and status? Buddha smiled. That is Ni De, the person you wish to inquire about. I save beings without regard to their wealth, for all beings are equal. Finally, Buddha asked, Like the fragrant lotus flowers that bloom in muddy waters, should we discard the beautiful lotus just because of the mud? 20. Buddha's Joint Pain In the Awakening Journey Sutra, it's mentioned that Buddha Siddhartha Gautama once suffered from joint pain. This was one of the ten tribulations he faced in his life. Many people wonder how someone as enlightened as Buddha could fall ill. Buddha explained that it was due to the residual karma from his past lives, which he had to repay in this life. Buddha recounted a story from a long time ago in the city of Shravasti in ancient India. The son of a wealthy man suddenly fell seriously ill with a high fever. There was a renowned physician in the city known for his expertise in treating rare and difficult diseases. The wealthy man's son urgently called for this physician's help. He promised the physician, Please cure my illness. If I recover, I will reward you generously with gold and jewels. The physician devoted himself to treating the young man. Thanks to the physician's diligent care, the wealthy man's son soon recovered. However, when it was time to fulfill his promise, the young man, driven by greed, broke his word. Later, the son fell ill again and once more enticed the physician with false promises for treatment. But just like before, upon recovering, he again broke his promise. This cycle happened three times with the son making promises and then reneging on them each time he was cured. After the third betrayal, the physician was furious. He felt mocked and disrespected by the wealthy man's son. In revenge, the physician gave the son a poisonous medicine that led to his unclear death. Buddha then revealed, Do you know who that physician was? It was me in a past life, and the wealthy man's son was the previous life of Devadatta. Buddha continued, Because I poisoned the wealthy man's son, I was condemned to hell. After enduring immense suffering there and then being reborn as an animal and a hungry ghost, I still bear the pain from that karma in this life as a Buddha. We must always be mindful and cultivate our body, speech, and mind to avoid creating negative karma. In Buddhism, cultivating body, speech, and mind means to refrain from doing, saying, or thinking evil. Buddha's story of karma reminds us not to seek revenge. When we harm others in vengeance, it's like holding a double-edged knife that injures both the other person and ourselves. Ultimately, harming others is also harming ourselves. 21. The Poisoned Arrow Back in the day, among Buddha's disciples, there was one who was very impatient. Not long after following Buddha, he eagerly wanted all the answers about the universe, life, and death. So, one day, Buddha told him a story about a man who was shot with a poisoned arrow and was seriously wounded. When his family wanted to find a skilled doctor to help him, the man stopped them. He said that before calling for a doctor, he wanted to know who attacked him and why. What was the attacker's status? Where did he come from? He also wanted to know if the attacker was tall or strong and what his skin color was, light or dark. Furthermore, he questioned what kind of bull was used. Was it made from a specific type of wood? And the bowstring, was it made of silk or hemp? Now, additionally, he wanted to know if the feathers on the arrow were from a vulture, a peacock, or an eagle, because he posed too many complex questions that his family couldn't immediately answer. He died before getting any answers for himself. What's the hidden meaning behind the story of the poisoned arrow? By telling this story to his disciple, 
Buddha wanted to convey that he was like the man hit by the poisoned arrow, not knowing what was most important for him, and instead sought far-reaching questions. One of Buddha's teachings is to live in the present, focus on the essentials in life, and not chase after distant, futile things that have little meaning for our existence. As Buddha said, don't dwell on the past, don't dream of the future, concentrate the mind on the present moment. Hearing the story of this man, many of us might find him foolish, but aren't we sometimes acting just like him? Out of curiosity, we often focus too much on issues that aren't crucial to our lives, wasting time and missing out on our real goals and necessities. Therefore, it's essential to have the wisdom to distinguish what's truly important to us and focus on those things, rather than pursuing unreachable and excessive matters. This can make a difference between overcoming difficulties or being hindered by them. Buddha said, Hearing one useful word that brings peace to your mind is better than a thousand useless words. And to not get lost in life's complexities, follow these four rules. 1. Focus on what truly matters. Getting sidetracked or distracted isn't always bad. Sometimes it can bring unexpected, exciting ideas. However, it becomes an issue if it happens too often without a real purpose. Thus, when facing a problem, it's best to address it thoroughly. Otherwise, it'll worsen and become unmanageable. 2. Take one step at a time. There's a saying, after eating the olive, throw away the pit, implying that after solving one issue, move on to the next without multitasking, as it's less effective and can ruin everything. 3. Let things flow naturally. Sometimes, faced with countless unsatisfactory situations, our minds become chaotic, unsure of what to do next. In those moments, let things flow. Allow your mind to be free from worry, anger, or disappointment, and solutions will naturally arise. 4. Eliminate the unnecessary. There's a saying, He who owns less and wants less is richer than those who have and desire more. Sometimes we think happiness means acquiring what we don't have. But when you're accustomed to a life with only basic amenities and enrich your knowledge, you'll realize you're not lacking much. Appreciating what's worth loving means more than possessing expensive, excessive, or unnecessary items. Famous artist Leonardo da Vinci once said, Simplicity is the ultimate satisfaction, and Buddha's story about the poisoned arrow also aims to convey this message. 22. Buddha says everyone has four life companions. Once upon a time, there was a man with four wives, which was common in ancient India. One day, the man fell ill and was close to death. Feeling lonely in his final moments, he asked his first wife to join him in the afterlife. My dear wife, I have always loved and cared for you. Now that I'm dying, will you follow me in death? He awaited her agreement, but she refused, saying, My dear husband, I know you've always loved me, and now you're about to die, but it's time for us to part. Farewell, my dear. The man then asked his second wife the same, expressing his love and trust in her. But she too refused coldly, stating, the first wife already refused to follow you. How could I? Your love for me was selfish. Lying on his deathbed, he turned to his third wife with the same request. But she too refused. My dear husband, I truly love you and am saddened by my fate. So I will escort you to your final resting place. That's the last thing I can do for you. Finally, he turned to his fourth wife, whom he had treated poorly and neglected. Assuming she would refuse his request to die with him, he asked her out of desperation and fear of dying alone. Surprisingly, she agreed, saying, My dear husband, I will follow you. Whatever happens, I'm determined to be by your side forever. I can't live without you. So, what does this story mean? How do you interpret it?
Through the eyes of Buddha Siddhartha Gautama, this story has a profound meaning, beyond just a tale of ancient Indian family life. According to Buddha, everyone, regardless of gender, has four life companions. One, the first companion is our body, which we always cherish. We bathe, eat, beautify, and care for it as the man did for his first wife. But unfortunately, at the end of our lives, we cannot take our bodies with us. It will be cremated and returned to dust and emptiness. Two, the second companion is our wealth, possessions, job, status, and fame, which we work hard to acquire. We always want more and fear losing these material things, but at life's end, they remain external to us and cannot be taken along. Three, the third companion is our relationships with parents, siblings, relatives, friends, and society. They will mourn us and accompany us to our final resting place, sharing our sorrow. But they cannot follow us into the afterlife. We are born alone and die alone. No one can join us on this final journey. 4. The fourth companion, as mentioned by Gautama Buddha, is our soul, which will accompany us to eternity. Throughout our lives, we often neglect our souls, allowing negative emotions like anger and greed to dominate. We focus on earning money, rarely considering how to nourish, protect, and beautify our souls. Yet, in death, only our soul remains with us. Therefore, love and cherish yourself, but don't indulge excessively. Don't adorn yourself with overly extravagant attire or dine on extravagances that cost others a year's work. Value material wealth, but don't trade it for what's truly precious. In relationships, don't overly rely or depend on others, nor take extreme actions when things don't go your way. Reserve a peaceful corner for your soul, so that as the years pass, even as you age, you retain the innocence and purity of childhood, love for people and life, and an appreciation for the beauty around you. 23. The Story of the Monk and His Ho Due to this challenging nature to overcome, in ancient times, wise and enlightened individuals couldn't let go of a mere ho because of their greed, leading them to abandon the monkhood six times. It was only on their seventh attempt at renouncing the worldly life when deep meditation arose that they were able to conquer this greed. After explaining this, the master shared a story from the past. This tale was told by the master while at Jetavana about an elder named Siddhatha Sariputta. According to the story, Sariputta was a young man from a good family in Savathi. One day, on his way home after plowing the fields, he entered a monastery and received delicious and rich food from the bowl of an elder monk. He thought to himself, we work hard day and night but never get to eat such sweet food. Maybe I should become a monk. So he left his worldly life behind. After a month and a half of diligent practice, he was overwhelmed by distractions and returned to lay life. Tired of the struggle for survival, he again left it all behind to become a monk and learn the supreme teachings. This cycle of leaving and returning to lay life happened six times, but on the seventh, he became a fully ordained monk. This monk mastered the seven sets of the Abhidhamma, higher teachings, and through repeatedly reciting the teachings and practicing deep meditation, he achieved the state of an arahant. His fellow monks mocked him, asking, Hey, wise one, how come your distractions didn't grow before, and now how have you managed to overcome them? Dear sages, from this day forward, I can no longer return to a household life. The fact that he achieved the state of Arahant was discussed in the assembly hall. Dear sages, even though he became an Arahant after such trials, Elder Chittahatha Sariputta left the monkhood six times. Truly, it was a mistake typical of ordinary human nature. 24. The story of the man who harmed the garden. 
an illustration. A wise teacher came and asked, Hey monks, what are you guys discussing today? After hearing their issue, the wise teacher said, Hey monks, the minds of ordinary people are light and fickle, hard to control, influenced by things around them and easily attached. Once attached, it's not easy to let go quickly. It's really good to control such a mind. Once the mind is controlled, it brings peace, hard to hold, quick to react, swept away by desires. How good it is to control the mind. A controlled mind brings peace. Dhammapada 35 Because of this difficulty in control in the past, wise people, just because of one ho they couldn't let go of due to greed, gave up the monastic life six times. Only on the seventh attempt, when they entered deep meditation, were they able to control their greed. After saying this, the wise teacher told a story from the past. Long ago, when King Brahmadatta ruled in Varanasi, the Bodhisattva was born into a gardener's family. Growing up, the Bodhisattva was known as the wise man with the hoe. With his hoe, the Bodhisattva cleaned up the land, planted various crops like vegetables, gourds, cucumbers, and other greens to sell and make a living, though it was tough. Apart from this hoe, the Bodhisattva had no other possessions. One day, the Bodhisattva thought, Why live in a family? I should go and become a monk. He hid the hoe in a secret place and became a hermit. But remembering the hoe, he couldn't cut off his attachment to the cracked hoe, and he left the monastic life. This happened a second time, a third time. Up to the sixth time, the Bodhisattva buried the hoe in a secret place, became a monk, and then left again. On the seventh time, the Bodhisattva thought, Just because of this cracked hoe, I keep leaving the monkhood. Now I will throw it into the big river and then become a monk. The Bodhisattva went to the river bank, then thought, If I see where the hoe falls, I could go there and pick it up. Thinking this, with the strength and persistence of an elephant, the Bodhisattva swung the hoe handle over his head three times, closed his eyes, threw the hoe into the middle of the river, and roared a lion's roar three times. I have won! I have won! 25. Seven Lessons from Buddha's Teachings 1. People are punished by their own anger. Inside each person lies a lethal weapon, not aimed at others but rather at oneself, and that is anger. Buddha once beautifully said that anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Life is full of impermanence and things often don't go as planned. We should get used to this, cultivating resilience and calmness to first avoid harming ourselves and then to prevent unleashing our anger on our loved ones, always striving to create a joyful and positive atmosphere around us. Achieving this first lesson means you can live a long and fortunate life. 2. What you fear losing, you will lose. People are born with inherent greed. As children, it's food. As adults, it's wealth, money, and status. By middle age, it's the fear of death. Constantly fearing loss, people tire easily, often feeling suffocated in their quest to retain what they desire. For a peaceful life, maintain a balance in everything and use your excess to help others, which in turn will alleviate your fears and anxieties. 3. Outer beauty attracts the eyes, but kindness conquers the soul. A beautiful woman can instantly draw attention, but a kind and good-hearted woman is the one who can stay by your side until the end of life. 4. Three things cannot be hidden. The sun, the moon, and the truth. The truth is eternal, like the sun and moon, and will reveal itself eventually. Therefore, respect the sanctity of truth and live an upright life with a sincere heart, maintaining your integrity wherever you are and no matter the circumstances. 5. Love and care for yourself. Buddha said it's great to love others, but don't forget that there's someone equally deserving of love and care, and that's you. 
Don't neglect yourself on this journey. Don't exhaust yourself chasing after vanities. Cherish the body you were given. Be thankful for every heartbeat and appreciate your soul that, despite its wounds, never loses faith and optimism. 6. Personal experience is the ultimate filter. One of people's follies is believing others without verifying for themselves, which can lead to mistakes and even harm others' reputations or lives. In today's tech-savvy era, a single comment can cause widespread distress. Therefore, take time to observe, analyze, learn, and make your own conclusions, letting your personal experiences serve as the ultimate filter. 7. If someone likes a flower, they may pluck it. But if they love a flower, they will water it daily. Be wise to discern who likes you and who truly loves you. Love is beautiful, but without clear discernment, it's easy to fall into its sweet trap. To love without disappointment and live without regret, be wise from the start in understanding people. 26. The Tale of the Venomous Snake At that time, King Balani, having just quelled a rebellion at the border, bathed in a river. After adorning himself with all sorts of jewels, the king rode on an elephant's back. While on his way, he heard Bodhisattva shouting loudly and thought, This person is saying I have won. Whom did he defeat? I should call him. When the Bodhisattva arrived, the king asked, Friend, I have just returned from a victorious battle, but whom have you defeated? The Bodhisattva replied, Your Majesty, whether you win a thousand or a hundred thousand battles, it's all in vain if you haven't conquered your own troubles. It is by overcoming desire within myself that I have conquered these troubles. While saying this, the Bodhisattva looked at the great river, entered a meditative state focusing on water, achieved a meditative realization, and preached to the king from mid-air reciting this verse. A victory that doesn't last is no better than defeat. The true victory, the best, is the conquest of oneself. Hearing this teaching, the king's delusions and troubles were eradicated, and his thoughts turned to renouncing worldly life. Right then, his desire for the throne was also extinguished. The king asked the Bodhisattva, Where will you go now? The Bodhisattva answered that he would go to the Himalayas to become a hermit. The king expressed his desire to renounce the world and join the bodhisattva. Everyone present, including Brahmin householders and the assembled crowd, decided to follow the king. The citizens of Balanai, upon hearing that their king was going to renounce the world after listening to the wise one's teachings, wondered why they should stay behind and also sought to renounce the world. From within the twelve-mile city, all citizens set out. The congregation stretched for twelve miles as they followed the Bodhisattva into the Himalayas. At that moment, the throne of the Lord of Gods, Sakra, became hot. Upon investigating, Sakra saw the wise one leading a great renunciation. Estimating the large number of followers and the accommodations they would need, Sakra summoned Visakama, the god of construction, and instructed, Dear friend, the wise one is leading a great act of renunciation, and they will need places to stay. Go to the Himalayas on a flat area and construct a hermitage that spans 30 miles in length and 15 miles in width. Visakama complied and did as instructed. This is a summary. Full details are given in the Jataka tale, number 509. Visakama magically created shelters in the hermitage, chased away noisy animals, birds, and non-human beings, and made a path in each cardinal direction, wide enough for one person. Then Visakama returned to his abode. The wise one, leading the congregation, entered the Himalayas to the hermitage provided by Sakra, bringing along renunciant attire created by Visakama, renounced the world himself first, then ordained the congregation, distributed living quarters to them. All of them renounced their worldly status, 
equivalent to that of Sacra. The hermitage, stretching 30 miles, was filled. After preparing meditation objects and practicing loving-kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, the Bodhisattva taught meditation topics to the congregation. All achieved meditative realization and were reborn in the Brahma heavens. And all who supported the congregation were reborn in the realm of the gods. The Buddha said, Thus, monks, when the mind is controlled by troubles, it's truly hard to let go. The objects of desire that arise are very hard to abandon, causing even the wise to become foolish. After this sermon, the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths. At the end of this teaching, some attained stream entry, some once return, some non-return, and some achieved arhatship. The Buddha linked the two stories, identifying the past lives. At that time, the king was Ananda, the congregation was the Buddha's followers, and the wise one was me. 27. 18 Buddha's Teachings on Daily Speech and Behavior 1. In urgent matters, speak slowly. Life will have its moments of urgency, requiring swift action. But it's especially in these times you need to remain calm, think a bit, then speak clearly and slowly. This way, your listener will feel stable and trust the information you provide. 2. For minor things, be humorous. Sometimes a joke can increase friendliness with those around you. Especially when reminding someone, using humor can keep the mood light and the advice welcome. 3. If unsure, speak cautiously. Life's issues are complex and multifaceted. If you're uncertain, think carefully before you speak to avoid inadvertently affecting others negatively. Being careful makes you seem more reliable. 4. Don't speculate on the uncertain. It's impossible to predict events that haven't happened. Speculation or talking about uncertainties can be frustrating for others, so avoid it. This shows maturity and responsibility. 5. Don't make promises on the unattempted. As the saying goes, don't promise pottery without a diamond drill. If unsure about accomplishing something, don't commit to others. Breaking trust is easy, but building it is hard. Keeping promises makes you reliable. 6. Avoid hurtful words. Don't say things that could hurt those around you, especially loved ones. This will show your kindness and help maintain and enhance relationships. 7. Keep painful issues private. Sharing your sorrows is natural, but oversharing can burden and alienate others. It may also give the impression that you're dumping your pain on them. 8. Be careful when discussing others. Maintain a respectful distance in relationships. Being close is valuable, but overstepping boundaries can make others feel unsafe. 9. Listen to what others say about you. Pay attention to others' feedback on your actions. It shows understanding and humility. Don't react hastily. Think and understand the situation better. 10. Speak clearly to your children. Especially with teenagers who are easily influenced by emotions, use a calm and firm approach to communicate clearly. This builds a good relationship and is persuasive. 11. Avoid discouraging words. Encouraging words can be a great motivator. Even if no one else encourages you, encourage yourself. Self-doubt can lead to downfall. 12. Don't speak in anger. Anger can make you lose control over your words and actions, leading to hurtful statements. Stay calm and silent in such situations. 13. Don't complain. Constant complaints can create a negative image of you and lead to gossip and conflicts, causing unnecessary stress. 14. Avoid harmful words. Insults may bring momentary satisfaction but damage your character in the long run. 15. Don't boast. Self-praise can turn others off and attract negative attention. True talent will be recognized without boasting. 16. Avoid lies. 
Buddhism teaches against lying as it destroys trust and leads to regret. Honesty is valued and respected. 17. Keep secrets. Everyone has secrets. Revealing them carelessly can have consequences far beyond your expectations. Recognize the seriousness of secrets and be discreet. 18. Respect privacy. Everyone has private matters they wish to keep to themselves. Avoid discussing others' private affairs. Showing discretion now can bring future blessings. 28. Buddha's Ten Teachings 1. When happy, it's easy to slip up in speech. There's an old saying, don't let your happiness peak too high, because at the height of joy, we often let our guard down, act impulsively, and say things without thinking. While the intention is to share happiness, speaking without restraint can accidentally hurt others, leading to regret. 2. When angry rudeness comes easily. In moments of anger, people struggle to control their actions, leading to rudeness and regret. When feeling insulted or frustrated, it's crucial to stay calm and silent instead of speaking out of turn, as harsh words are often spoken in such states. 3. When shocked, it's easy to lose composure. Ancients advised, stay indifferent to gain and loss to maintain inner peace and calm in all situations. Life's full of unexpected events, and losing composure can lead to regrettable outcomes. 4. In sadness, Beauty and spirit suffer. Sadness affects not just outward appearance, but also inner spirit. Facing heartbreaking situations can lead to depression and a lack of readiness for life's challenges. However, it's essential to remain strong, encourage oneself, and move forward, leaving sorrow behind. Traditional Chinese medicine teaches that sadness can harm health, dulling the complexion and weakening the spirit, thus impacting internal organs. 5. In exuberance, oversight in judgment happens. Being overly pleased can lead to negligence, causing losses. Excessive joy might make us forget our standards and principles, leading to poor judgment and mistakes. 6. In fear, it's easy to lose integrity. Fear can overwhelm and break our principles, making us passive and unable to find a way out. Facing various fears, it's possible to overcome them by confronting challenges with all our abilities and confidence. 7. Hoarding leads to greater loss. Chasing after fame and wealth beyond necessity can bring misfortune, as the gains do not compensate for the losses. Knowing when to stop, Maintaining peace of mind and keeping life simple can prevent mental and spiritual exhaustion and the jealousy of others. 8. Obsession can lead to loss of virtue. Being overly obsessed, whether in words or actions, can lead us to compromise our principles, resulting in deceit and unethical behavior. This obsession might lead to regrets too late to address. 9. Exaggerating can erode trust. Old wisdom holds that unfulfilled promises are shameful, especially when made lightly. Casual promises that aren't kept can destroy trust, which is hard to build but easy to lose. Exercise caution. 10. Excessive desires can be deadly. Laozi said, Excess in desires can lead to physical and spiritual ruin, even endangering life. Managing desires and focusing on passion Self-cultivation and contentment can lead to a peaceful life. 29. Buddha's Teachings on Love Between Couples Late one night in a temple, someone knelt before the Buddha seeking advice on love. Person. O oh, enlightened Buddha, I am married but deeply in love with another woman. I'm at a loss. Buddha. Can you be certain she is the last and only one you will love in your life? Person. Yes, I believe so. Buddha. You think of divorcing and then marrying her? Person. But my current wife is gentle, kind, and virtuous. Would leaving her be cruel and immoral, O Buddha? Buddha. To be in a marriage without love is the true cruelty and immorality. You love another now, not your wife. Your path is just. 
person, yet my wife loves me deeply, O Buddha, Buddha. Then she is happy, person, but she will suffer greatly if I leave for another. How is that happiness, O Buddha? Buddha, in your marriage, she still holds love for you while you've lost your love for her. Suffering comes from losing happiness, so you are the one who suffers. Person, leaving her for another means she loses me, making her the sufferer. Buddha, you are mistaken. You are only her true love in the marriage. If you cease to be, her true love will find another, for her real love in the marriage has never been lost. Thus, she is the one who will be happy, and you will suffer. Person, she once said she'd only love me in this life. She won't love another. Buddha, haven't you said the same? Person, I, I, Buddha. Now look at the three candles before you. Which burns brightest? Person. Honestly, I can't tell. They seem equally bright. Buddha. The candles represent three women. One is the woman you love now. But among all beings, women are not just millions. Even among these three candles, you can't find which burns brightest. How can you be sure this woman is the last and only one for you? Person. I... I, Buddha, now hold a candle before you and tell me which shines brightest, person. Naturally, the one before me. Buddha, now put it back and tell me which shines brightest. Person, truthfully, I still can't discern the brightest. Buddha, the candle you held is like the woman you currently love. Love emerges from the heart. When you focus on it, it seems the brightest. Once you put it back, you lose that sense of brightness. What you call your last and only love is like a reflection or a moon in the water, ultimately empty, a hollow affair. Person, I understand now. You're not urging me to divorce hastily, but to enlighten me on the truth of love. Buddha, true insight needs no explanation. Go now. Person, I now realize who I truly love, my current wife. O Buddha. 30. The Most Meaningful Gift in the World One day, a follower came to a Zen master and asked, I'm married, but I find myself deeply in love with another woman. What should I do now? The Zen master asked, Are you sure she is truly the one you love most in the world? Yes, she has given me the most beautiful moments. She is truly wonderful the follower asserted. Instead of directly answering his question, the master asked the follower to look at three candles in the incense burner in front of them and identify which one shone the brightest. The follower replied, They all shine the same. How can I tell which one is the brightest? The master then said, Pick up one candle, hold it before you. Now, with your heart, see which candle shines the brightest. Of course. The candle in front of me is the brightest, the follower answered. The master continued, Now, put the three candles back as they were and look carefully to see which one is the brightest. The follower said, If they are as they were, their brightness is the same. It's impossible to tell which is the brightest. Exactly, the master smiled. Actually, seeing the three candles is like encountering that woman in your life. When you put it in front of you and look at it with your heart, it seems to be the most beautiful. But when it goes back to its original place, it no longer shines any light at all. So this kind of love, like the moon's reflection in water, cannot withstand the test of time and ultimately is nothing but an illusion. After a pause, the master added, in marriage, people often overlook each other's strengths and instead magnify the flaws. What is true love? It is sharing hardships, being tolerant of each other. It may seem ordinary, but it is deep and worth cherishing for a lifetime. After hearing this, the follower suddenly pictured his wife, who gave up an overseas job opportunity to let him focus on his work and endured the cold winters to knit him sweaters for warmth. He felt an epiphany, thanked the master, and rushed home. P. 
People often lose their way because of momentary blindness, looking for solace in the wrong places due to fleeting loneliness. In truth, home, always welcoming us and our loved ones willing to sacrifice for us, is where we belong. Home is our safe harbor from the storms, a place for our souls and the most priceless gift we should cherish and love all our lives. Finding someone willing to face everything with you, to share the burdens and joys, and to live through simple yet happy days together, that is the most valuable gift in the world. 31. What sets people apart? People are set apart by their virtues and good qualities, not by material possessions. In reality, money won't stick around for long because once it decides to leave, it will do so swiftly. Having money is one thing, but putting it in the right place is another. Wrong investments lead to losses. Intelligence must be applied correctly to succeed. Nowadays, people are too attached to material things and forget that the greatest connection is with a pure conscience. Wisdom is the greatest gift nature has given humanity, yet many fail to embrace it. Gaining wisdom requires effort and learning. The more life experiences you have, the more valuable insights you gain. You'll see that well-educated people are very different from those who aren't. It's only the less knowledgeable who tend to look down on others. Of all the hardships, suffering from ignorance is the greatest. To become the wisest, you must first admit you're the most ignorant. Gradually overcoming your ignorance, you can become the wisest. Remember, you're always overcoming ignorance because you're human. When you're angry, you're the first to suffer the consequences. Forgiveness is a mark of greatness. No ocean or sky is as vast as the human spirit. Typically, people without money suffer from poverty, but those with money suffer from other things. It's hard to tell real from fake these days because some fakes seem more real than the real things. Only the very discerning can tell the difference. Everyone has their hidden depths. We can only live in the present, not in the past or the future. The present moment is sacred. I admire the innocence and purity of children. Their joy is genuine and endearing. Many say that children are their greatest joy and blessing. Remember, a child only comes into being through the union of a mother and a father. This shows that joy comes from the collaboration of two or more elements. Therefore, share your love with those around you. Those who hoard everything for themselves are mistaken. Raising children requires a lot of investment in nutrition and affection. Just like a balu egg needs both the yolk and the white to nourish the developing duckling inside. People enjoy balu because both the duckling and the egg parts are nutritious. An egg needs to be incubated by the mother duck to hatch into a duckling. This shows that every child needs love and care. Those called teacher deserve our utmost respect. Doctors, educators, monks, priests, bishops, popes, etc. They are the foundation of society's morality. People differ in their virtues and positive traits. 32. The Story of the Elderly Monk for Hire Zen master Bach and Hugh from Japan had a disciple who often complained that his elderly father, despite his advanced age, was still obsessed with earning money instead of pursuing spiritual practices. Whenever the son reminded him, the old man firmly stated, If spiritual practice could directly result in money, let me know. Otherwise, don't bother me. One day, after hearing the disciples' concerns, the Zen master said, This afternoon, go tell your father that Master Bach An is too busy with work to engage in spiritual practice as he would like. He asks you to find someone to meditate on his behalf. For every ten recitations of the Buddha's name, one will earn a certain amount of money. It's important to choose someone honest and fair to make this exchange. The hired person can receive their payment daily or weekly. Following the Zen master's advice, 
the disciple told his father, seeing this as a genuine opportunity to earn money, the old man eagerly agreed. Besides, for every ten recitations that earned him money, he happily added two more recitations as a gift to the master. The agreement was made, and the old man went to the temple to collect his money daily. Eventually, to save time, he decided to collect his earnings weekly. After a while, the old man stopped coming to collect his money. Following the Zen master's instruction, the son let his father do as he wished. Besides the three meals a day, the old man sat upright in front of the Buddha statue and continued his recitations. One day, the son noticed his father had almost stopped moving the prayer beads, his eyes lightly closed, breathing evenly and gently. The son immediately informed the Zen master. Zen master Bak An visited and observed the elderly man. Though the man's posture was slightly bent due to his age, his complexion was rosy and his face bore a look of serene tranquility. The Zen master softly told the son, as light as a passing breeze, Your father has entered meditation. In this way, the Zen master taught the old man meditation. 33. The Beggar According to Buddhist teachings, there once was a beggar who approached Buddha Siddhartha and lamented, No matter what I do, I never succeed. Why is that? Buddha replied, It's because you haven't learned to give to others. The beggar said, But I have nothing at all. How can I, a beggar, give anything of value? Buddha explained, It's not like that. A person without money can still give others these seven things. One, first is to share a smile and be friendly with others. Two, second is to be kind, to speak encouraging, comforting, and humble words without harboring jealousy. Three, third is to be generous with yourself, to open your heart and be sincere with others, avoiding deceit and harm. Four, fourth, look at others with kindness, not judgmentally or superficially. Five. Fifth, be accommodating and helpful through your actions, like picking up something someone else has dropped without being greedy. Six. Sixth is to offer your seat to the elderly, the vulnerable, women and children on public transport. Seven. Seventh, offer your place for others to rest without cursing or driving away those who are struggling or homeless. If you can cultivate these seven habits, luck will surely follow you. Buddha's teachings on giving and receiving. In practice, giving to others means accumulating good karma for oneself, building a foundation of wealth for both the present and the future. Therefore, beyond being generous and forgiving towards others, a true Buddhist practitioner also gives with the intent to let go of greedy, selfish, miserly thoughts to improve oneself. A true Buddhist, ready to offer what others need, even the things they cherish or even their own life. Thus, giving to others is a duty, a sacred and noble act. If we dare to give what we love and cherish, it's truly selfless giving. To achieve such noble giving, we must first possess the wisdom to see the true nature of life as impermanent and selfless. This understanding illuminates the path to selfless giving, advancing towards the perfection of generosity, where gifts are given unconditionally and without expectation. The more we receive, the greater our debt of gratitude, unless we generate merit to dedicate back to the donor. Hence, both the giver and the receiver must cultivate merit through practice so that the act of giving and offering becomes a virtuous deed, achieving great benefits as Buddha taught. The Buddhist scriptures say, If two practitioners, both respectful towards the three jewels, with equal moral discipline and wisdom, differ in their act of giving, the one who gives more will reap fuller results in material wealth and influence. This advantage will lead to health, longevity, beauty, happiness, and high status, which many aspire to. Therefore, beyond practicing moral discipline, 
concentration, and wisdom to transform the afflictive emotions of greed, hatred, and delusion, a Buddhist must also cultivate compassion, helping, sharing, and making offerings to the Three Jewels. Lay Buddhist practitioners practice giving to contribute to building a civilized, beautiful, sustainable, and enduring humanity, thereby perfecting themselves. 34. The Bonds of Love There was a guy heartbroken because his love married someone else. Feeling down, he went to a temple and asked a monk, Why did she marry someone else when I loved her so much? The monk smiled and showed him a mirror. In it, there was a beautiful woman lying dead by the roadside, naked. Everyone who passed by just walked away. Only one guy stopped, but he only covered her with a cloth and then left too. Eventually, another man came and buried the woman's body. Looking at the heartbroken man, the monk said, In a past life, you were just the one who covered her. The man she married now was the one who buried her. That's what we call a debt. You only had a connection with her. 35. The Story of Infidelity Person Dear Enlightened Buddha, I am a married man deeply in love with another woman. I really don't know what to do. Buddha, can you be certain that this woman you love now will be the only one for you for the rest of your life? Person, yes, I believe so. Buddha, then you should divorce and marry her. Person, but my current wife is gentle, kind, and virtuous. Would it be cruel and immoral to leave her, dear Buddha? Buddha, in a marriage without love, staying is what's truly cruel and immoral. You've fallen in love with someone else and no longer love your wife. Your decision to leave is correct. Person, but my wife truly loves me very much indeed, dear Buddha. Buddha, then she is happy. Person, after I leave her for another woman, she will be in great pain. How is that happiness, dear Buddha? Buddha, in your marriage, your wife still loves you, but you've lost your love for her. Because you've fallen for another, it's you who will feel pain for losing happiness, not her. Person. But if I leave my wife and marry someone else, she will have lost me. She would be the one in pain. Buddha. You're mistaken. You're only the man your wife truly loves in the marriage. If someone like you ceases to exist, her true love in marriage will move on to someone else because her true love has never been lost. Thus, your wife will find happiness, and you will be the one in pain. Person, my wife once said she would only love me in this lifetime and no one else. Buddha, have you not said the same? Person, I, I, I. Buddha, now look at the three candles in front of you. Which one shines the brightest? Person, I truly can't tell. They seem equally bright. Buddha. Those three candles are like three women, one of which is the woman you're in love with now. There are millions and billions of women in the world. If you can't even tell which of the three candles shines the brightest or find the woman you love among them, how can you be sure that the woman you love now is the last and only one in your life? Person, I, 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 Buddha. Now hold a candle in front of you and see which one shines the brightest. Person, obviously the one in front of me now shines the brightest. Buddha, now put it back where it was and tell me which one shines the brightest. Person, truly, I can't see which candle shines the brightest. Buddha, in fact, the candle you just held is like the last woman you think you love. Love comes from the heart. When you feel love and pay attention, you see it as the brightest. When you put it back... You can't find that feeling again. The so-called last and only love of yours is just an illusion, ultimately empty and void. Person, oh, I understand now. You're not telling me to divorce my wife. You're helping me see the truth. Buddha, seeing through doesn't need explicit explanation. Go on your way. Person, now I truly know who I love. It's my current wife, dear Buddha. 
36. The Story of Chao Ni and Chi Thu In front of the Guan Yin Temple, countless people came to burn incense and pray every day, filling the air with fragrant smoke. On a horizontal beam in front of the temple, a spider wove its web, immersed daily in incense smoke and prayers, gradually gaining a Buddha-like nature. After a thousand years of cultivation, the spider became enlightened. One day, Buddha stopped by and asked the spider, seeing a connection between them, if it had gained true wisdom after a thousand years of cultivation. Delighted to meet Buddha, the spider eagerly agreed. Buddha asked, What is the most precious thing in the world? The spider thought and then answered, The most precious things are what we cannot have and what we have lost. Buddha nodded and left. Another thousand years passed, and the spider continued its cultivation, its Buddha nature growing stronger. Buddha visited again and asked if the spider remembered the question from a thousand years ago and if it had gained deeper understanding. The spider replied that the most precious things were still what we cannot have and what we have lost. Buddha suggested the spider think more about it and said he would return. Another thousand years went by, and one day, a strong wind blew a dewdrop onto the spider's web. The spider admired the dewdrop's sparkling beauty and felt happy, the happiest it had been in three thousand years. Suddenly, a strong wind blew the dewdrop away, leaving the spider feeling lost, lonely, and in pain. Buddha arrived and asked, Spider, in the past thousand years, have you considered what is the most precious thing in the world? Thinking of the dewdrop, the spider answered that the most precious things were still what we cannot have and what we have lost. Buddha said, Good. If you understand this, I'll give you a chance to live among humans. So, the spider was reborn into a wealthy family as a girl named Chao Ni. She grew into a beautiful and graceful young lady. At a celebration for the new top scholar Cam Locke, many beauties attended, including Chao Nai. She wasn't worried or jealous because she knew he was the fate Buddha had brought her. Days later, Chao Ni and her mother visited the temple, coinciding with Cam Locke and his mother's visit. After praying, their mothers chatted while Chao Ni and Cam Locke talked in the corridor. Chao Ni was happy to be with her beloved, but Cam Locke seemed overly polite. Chao Ni asked if he remembered the spider from 16 years ago, but he was puzzled and left with his mother, thinking Chao Ni's imagination was too vivid. Confused by the turn of events and why Cam Locke felt no affection for her, Chao Ni learned that Cam Locke was to marry Princess Truong Fong, and she was to marry Prince Chi Thu. Devastated, she stopped eating and lay in agony, her soul nearly leaving her body. Prince Chi Thu rushed to her, confessing his love from the first moment he saw her and how he had begged his father to allow their marriage. He said if she died, he had no reason to live and attempted suicide. At that moment, Buddha appeared and explained to Chao Ni's soul that the dewdrop, Cam Lok, was brought by the wind, Truong Fong, and then taken away. Cam Lok was meant for Princess Truong Fong, and he was just a brief part of her life. Prince Chi Thu was the small tree in front of the temple, watching her for three thousand years, loving her, but she never noticed him. Buddha asked again what the most precious thing in the world was. Realizing the truth, Chao Ni told Buddha that the most precious thing wasn't what was lost or unattainable, but the happiness we currently hold. As Buddha disappeared, Chao Ni's soul returned to her body. She woke up and stopped Chi Thu from harming himself. 37. Buddha's Acceptance of Poisonous Mushrooms Kunda, a blacksmith, held great respect for Buddha. So, when he learned that Buddha and his followers were visiting Kusanara, he eagerly requested to offer them a meal. With heartfelt reverence, 
He carefully prepared a variety of dishes, including a delicious pot of mushroom soup with milk. Buddha instructed Kunda that the mushroom soup was meant only for him and no one else should eat it. The leftovers should be buried. He explained that no being in heaven, on earth, or in any realm, be it gods, humans, or any other, could digest this meal except for him. This story teaches us about Buddha's compassion, showing that a true teacher takes on dangers themselves and wishes for their disciples to have peace. After eating the meal, Buddha fell severely ill, showing symptoms of dysentery, enduring great pain but remaining mindful, aware, and patient throughout his suffering. Buddha knew in advance everything that would happen. Understanding this was the condition for his entering nirvana. The meal offered by Sujata, which supported me before I reached enlightenment, and the meal offered by Kunda before entering nirvana bring equal blessings and are of equal value. They are more precious and sublime than any other offering. The good karma from these two meals will result in happiness for many lifetimes, long life, wealth, and fame, enjoying the blessings of heavenly realms or royal grandeur. Furthermore, Buddha instructed his disciple Ananda to explain the circumstances of the problematic meal in this way, to clear any misunderstandings about Kunda, and to address any doubts among the community. He also foresaw that in times of degenerate teachings, there would be misconceptions and wrong views, Specifically, the view that a practitioner falling ill cannot attain enlightenment and that an enlightened one cannot become ill before passing away. This final meal was also a condition for Buddha to demonstrate sickness, to correct such views, showing that being ill does not mean one cannot achieve enlightenment and that enlightened beings can still experience physical illness. 38. Buddha's 66 Teachings on Life People suffer because they chase after the wrong things. If you don't want to be bothered, nobody else can make you feel troubled. It's because you can't let go. Always be thankful to those who bring challenges into your life. You should always be open and forgiving to all beings, no matter how bad they are, even if they have hurt you. Letting go is the only way to find true joy. When you're happy, remember that happiness isn't forever. When you're suffering, remember that pain won't last either. What you cling to today will become regret tomorrow. You can love, but don't get too attached, as separation is a natural part of life. Don't waste your life in places you'll regret later on. When you truly let go, you will be free from annoyances. Every wound is an opportunity to grow. The arrogant can be saved, but the insecure are hopeless until they understand and conquer themselves. Stop being dissatisfied with others all the time. You need to reflect on yourself. Being dissatisfied with others only makes you suffer. A person who can't forgive others will never find peace in their heart. If your heart is full of your own opinions and views, you'll never hear what others have to say. Destroying someone takes one sentence, but building them up takes a thousand. So, speak with kindness. You don't need to look back at who's cursing you. If a mad dog bites you, do you bite back? Never waste a moment thinking about someone you don't care for. Approach your grievances and dissatisfaction with compassion and gentleness so others can understand you. Why fill a vessel with poison? Why fill your heart with troubles? The things we can't have always seem beautiful because you know so little about them. Once you understand them deeply, you'll see they're not as perfect as you imagined. Living one day is a blessing, so cherish it. When I cried for not having shoes, I saw someone without feet. It's better to use a bit more effort to understand others than to reflect on yourself, right? Hating others is a huge loss for yourself. Everyone has a life, but not everyone appreciates it and even less cherish it. For those who don't understand life, it's like a punishment. Attachment is the source of all suffering. Letting go of attachment brings freedom. 
Don't be too sure of your own beliefs to avoid regrets. When you're honest with yourself, no one in the world can deceive you. Covering up your flaws by hurting others is despicable. Quietly wishing others well is an invisible form of generosity. Don't try too hard to guess what others are thinking. Without accurate judgment based on wisdom and experience, misunderstandings are common. To understand someone, just see if their intentions and actions align, then you'll know if they're sincere. The truth of life is hidden in the ordinary. The unclean gets smellier with perfume. Reputation and honor come from real talent and learning. Virtue naturally smells sweet. Time will pass and take your troubles away. Seeing simple things as complicated will only bring you pain. There's no cure for those who are always wary of others' kindness. Lying once means you have to make up ten more lies to cover it up. Why go through such trouble? Living a day without achieving anything is like living a life of crime. Creating good connections means not hurting anyone. Silence is the best response to slander. Respecting others dignifies yourself. With selfless love, you will have everything. Arriving is by chance. Leaving is inevitable. So, you should go with the flow without changing and stay steadfast amidst change. Compassion is your best weapon. Only by facing reality can you overcome it. Conscience is the fairest judge. You can deceive others, but never your conscience. Those who don't love themselves can't love others. Sometimes we need to ask ourselves, what are we chasing? What are we living for? Don't let a small dispute break a close friendship, nor a little anger make you forget deep gratitude. Be thankful for what you have and also for what you don't have. If you can think from someone else's perspective, that's real compassion. Speak without mocking or hurting others. Don't show off your talents and don't expose others' flaws. This way, enemies can become friends. Face conflicts and flaws in your heart honestly. Don't deceive yourself. Karma owes us nothing, so don't blame it. Most people spend their lives deceiving themselves, others, and being deceived by others. The heart is the biggest deceiver. Others may lie to you temporarily, but it can deceive you for a lifetime. As long as you maintain inner peace, everywhere is good. If one person is not enough, don't escape alone. Holding tightly to something means you only have that. If you let go, you'll have the chance to choose something else. A person who clings to their beliefs without letting go can only achieve limited wisdom. If you can live peacefully, that's a blessing. Many people won't see tomorrow's sun, become disabled today, lose their freedom, or lose everything they have. You have your view of life, and I have mine. I'm not related to you. If I can, I'll influence you. If not, I'll accept it. If you hope to grasp eternity, you need to control the present. Never let harsh words come out of your mouth, no matter how bad or evil others are. The more you curse them, the more polluted your heart becomes. Think of them as your good teachers. Others may go against karma, hurt us, beat us, and slander us. But we shouldn't hate them. Why? Because we must maintain our integrity and a pure soul. If someone has never experienced hardship, they'll find it hard to empathize with others. To learn the spirit of saving others from suffering, you first need to endure suffering. The world doesn't belong to you, so there's no need to give it up. What needs to be let go is your stubbornness. Everything serves us, but doesn't belong to us. Since we can't change the world around us, we have to change ourselves, facing everything with compassion and wisdom. Hey everyone, your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So, let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom.